Hello, everyone. I'm sure everyone has sound, to be honest. <laughs> um, I will just share my screen for a quick introduction. Yeah, I mean, hello, everyone. Um, it's great to have so many people here. Maybe you can just write hello in the chat and um, also write where you're zooming in from. It's always great to see everyone's location. I'm here in Berlin. How about you, Ian? How about Joel? How about either? Hey, welcome everyone. I'm calling in from uh, the Boston area, East Coast, USA. Hey, from sunny San Francisco. Foggy San Francisco, sorry. And from also foggy Copenhagen. Yeah, and hello, Jakub, Jeff, and Rabindra. Huh. Um, the chat is disabled. Um, Dokan, everyone is writing in the Q&A instead of the chat. Um, do you know what's the problem? Let me check. Can you see my message right now? Um, yes, but in the Q&A, people are writing that my chat is disabled. So um, can people maybe say if um, chat is working now or if something has changed? It would be great if we can make the chat work. Yeah, it's working. Chat is disabled <laughs> still. Huh. It looks like it's active now. Ah, okay, perfect, perfect. That's great. Okay. Good. Yeah, thanks for letting us know. And good that we um solved that issue. Great, so many people, so many locations. That's awesome. <laughs> Hi, Ben. <laughs> Some of the beauties of extended realities that not <laughs> all this geography gets blurred. Um, then yeah, let's let me start. So yeah, welcome everyone to today's open lectures together lecture together with Joel and Idu. Thank you very much for joining us today. And I will just start with a quick introduction about EXA Bootcamp. So yeah, I hope, I mean, many of you have already attended um, our open lectures in the past, and usually we are also uploading those on our EXA Bootcamp YouTube channel. So feel free to check those out as well if, if you like today's session. And um, yeah, so, so what is EXA Bootcamp? So basically what is important for us is that we are um, a skill to job academy. So all the skills that we are teaching are basically approved and are, um, are initiated by our advisory board because they are working at really large industry companies at really big XR studios and know um, which skills are actually currently missing in the industry. So that's very, um, very important for us that we are only teaching skills that are actually in, in high demand from industry companies. So um, yeah, and I hope that many of you are already part of the XR Creators Discord server. If you're not um, joined now, uh, it is um, getting more and more active. We are over over 3,000 people right now. Um, please share the invite link in the chat. If you're not there, please join. And uh, feel free to ask any question there you have about XR development, about career advice. We also have a job, um, a job channel where we are sharing open jobs and, um, yeah, and hopefully connecting the whole XR industry globally together. Um, yeah, so, so this is basically the learning path we are offering 
one extra foundations, extra prototyping for beginner level um, students, for beginner level talents, to our advanced level master classes where you can join if you already have several years of experience with XR development. So um, yeah, and for everything, um, what we are still, even for our beginner level classes, what we are still expecting is um, C -sharp, um, is a C sharp knowledge requirement, and um, to enable you, even if you don't have um, previous C sharp um, um, C sharp knowledge, you can take our free C sharp course. Which is available on our on our website, and once you've done that, you basically become eligible to take our boot camp. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're very happy that our um, alumni, our previous graduates, rate us always very highly, and um, that's also one of the advantages we have that um, there's really big companies sending their developers to our advanced level classes, and then they're also looking to hire from our graduates afterwards. Um, feel free to also check our trust pilot review um, reviews. Um, on Trustpilot. And yes, yeah, so, so basically all these companies are sending their, their developers to us, their talents to us to upskill for XR development and XR prototyping especially. Mm. So yeah, we have a, um, the, the XR Foundations um, and Prototyping Bootcamp is basically separated into two months and two months. So the first two months is XR Foundations, where you basically learn all the tools. Um, Unity, you learn more C Sharp, more programming, and become um, self-capable of developing prototypes. And then the next um, two months, the XR Prototyping, you are developing four XR prototypes um, and one MVP, which means um, a minimum viable product. And that means you're basically getting together in a group of students, you're um, re, um, creating the real environment of an XR studio, you're matched with a project manager and actually a technical manager, and they will also do the scoping together with you, um, and they will um, make the best to make you actually aware of how a, how a studio, how a real XR studio works. So um, so that when you have like job, when you're applying for jobs afterwards, you already have that experience and know how it works to work together in a team with other developers. Um, yeah, so um, also when you follow us on social media, on our LinkedIn profile, um, we are very proud to always share what our students are working on, what kind of um, prototypes they are basically able to already achieve um, with what they've learned in the, in the skills and um, in, the, in the course. And yeah, we think it's always, um, it's always very impressive to see what you can achieve after learning XR only, only for four months. Yeah, this is more use cases and feel free to also um, check our social media channels to learn more about that. And for us, our philosophy is that you should learn from the best of the best. So all our trainers are handpicked. Um, we are looking at different expertise areas and we are trying to find the, celeb the celebrities, the XR development celebrities to teach the skills we are offering in our different master classes from rendering um, optimizations to um, VR interactions to um, yeah, Unity ECS dots. And um, yeah, so also like, um, what is actually the advantage of taking one of our courses, be it, be it the bootcamp or be it the master classes, is that we are offering you a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentorship and support and live mentorship, and that is always increasing your accountability. So um, when you're like just taking a Udemy class, of course you have to really force yourself to um, be accountable to yourself and um, learn what's basically offered, and you learn more passively. Whereas when you take a master class or bootcamp with us, um, we are basically keeping you accountable towards the learning content. So we're making sure that you actually learn, that you actually create by yourself, that you prototype by yourself and not just watch other people create. Um, this is our schedule for 2022 and 2023. Um, if you're interested in any of our courses, feel free to reach out. And um, yeah, as I said, um, please join our Discord server. You can also reach, to, um, reach out to us personally there. And uh, yeah, and that's more on our advanced level courses. Um, HoloLens masterclass also starting in November this year. Then we have rendering optimization starting in October. And um, yeah, already talked about this. Um, Ferhan, do you have anything you wanted to add? Otherwise, I would say let's welcome our speakers and start with the open lecture. 
Thank you, Rahel. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We are quite crowded. I know that for some, it's actually vacation time. Instead of vacation, you are coming here to have some uh, knowledge about playful interactions. Today, we will have very interesting speakers. Uh, Ian will moderate the panel. Uh, he will probably mention a little bit about uh, his XR Bootcamp history, but uh, I would like to welcome also our speakers. They have just released a very interesting game. Probably they will also mention about that. So I'm looking forward. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. I mean, especially the bootcamp that Rahan mentioned. If you are interested, please reach me on Discord or uh, LinkedIn and make sure that uh, you have secured your spot because it's quite already um, booked out. I would say maybe a few slots left for the uh, next bootcamp starting in two weeks. So I hope that we can see some of you there, but otherwise we will be doing open lectures for the community and Discord uh, discussions as well. So looking forward, stage is yours, Ian. Hey, thank you for the introduction. Um, hi, I'm Ian. Yeah, as Farhan mentioned, I'm uh, both a previous student of XR Bootcamp and now uh, a mentor teaching with the Foundations and Prototyping course. Um, I'm also a huge nerd when it comes to anything XR related, and I'm super excited to have both Joel and Ito from Patch XR here. Um, they are the creators of one of my most recent favorite games called Patch World. Um, and maybe we can, would you guys like to, to speak a bit about yourselves or about um, the, what, you, what you've made? <laughs> Hey, and thanks. Uh, honored, to, honored to be here. I'm a fan of uh, XR Bootcamp, follow all the content. And as a creator myself, you know, it's really important we all share uh, our knowledge. So yeah, excited to uh, show you guys something a little different, uh, <laughs> as you're alluding to. Um, and I got uh, my teammate, Edo here. Edo, maybe you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. yeah, thanks a lot for having us. I think it's, uh, yeah, big fan of of what you're doing. So it's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Um, do we, uh, shall we get into the, the slides, the kind of meat of the, the presentation? Yeah, about? we're ready. Yeah, let's do this. Fantastic. Uh, share sound. So um, Joel, I will- While you are pulling up uh, one quick uh, question, or uh, like for the questions that you are having asking actually on the chat, please, please submit your questions on the Q&A tab. Uh, for example, um, one person is asking if it is uh, like a game or is it something like it um, much more VRDAW. So uh, please ask these kind of interesting questions on the questions tab because the chat is really running very quickly and it's hard for Ian and the speakers to catch up. So please um, share on the Q&A tab. So yes. the stage is yours. Yes, we, so we'll, uh, we'll, we have some information Hello. for you about the prototyping um, for Patchworld. And maybe that was my slip up. I shouldn't have called Patchworld a game because it's definitely more than a game. Um, but you can make games with it. So yes, you can make just about great. anything. <laughs> was discovering as playing it recently um yeah awesome so joe start. i'll let you i'll yeah. let you start and just let me next and i'll change the slides cool so it will be driving hey, hey everyone it's awesome uh, to share a little bit about patch world it's something very special it's not quite a game uh it's not quite an engine um but i think one of the most beautiful things is how we use uh, patch world to prototype ideas quickly, especially the stuff that's very playful. Um, and maybe we go to the next uh, slide. So patch world, you can uh, try it out, uh, just released recently on the Oculus store. And what's really the why behind uh, what we're about to show you is it's all about creating playful uh, technologies. And we want to make prototyping, uh, simple ideas all the way to really complex ideas easy for anyone to get into um, without boundaries. So I know a lot of people in this audience are, some are real experts, some are just starting in their 
uh, creation path. And uh, what we're going to focus on here is really about the be the beginning before anyone has any experience, particularly with coding. Um, and so that's, you know, a lot of our mission is about exposing that. And we use music as our uh, as our universal entryway into into uh, creating expressive, uh, playful technologies. So a little bit uh, background on, on Edo and I just so you see where we're coming from. Um, you know, I, I used to design toys, educational toys, uh, you can buy the Piper computer kits designed for seven year olds and up to build physically right. Um, things as complex as computers and then using games like Minecraft to um, continue the sort of programming and expression. Uh, and so, I, you know, I come from that world and some academia teaching at Stanford and, and studied at MIT. Um, and so that so my bias will be coming from sort of the physical world of and product design and toy design. And Edo is, is, uh, is my awesome teammate, CEO of Patch. Uh, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about where you're coming from. Yes, yeah, so I come from the digital arts background. And so it was a mix between technology and, and yeah, animation, storytelling, and digital media in general. So I come from more from a like a visual uh, simulations background. So I was doing a lot of programming, like uh, to 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 run these visual simulations. And then I fall in love with sound because I've been I was born in Mexico. I've been traveling around. Like I never lived more than five years in one place in my entire life and every place i will go you will find somebody drumming or playing or singing so it was a really a really interesting way of connecting with people so yeah we start uh, before this project I was doing MOOCs, which is uh, basically like a sandbox uh, yeah so it's like a sandbox uh, uh, software where you can build your own instruments and the goal was to make you feel like an inventor of music machines and like being an ant person inside of the circuits of a synthesizer and today we are still using some of these philosophies but now we are bringing it to worlds and and yeah collaboration and getting together so awesome and then just to show uh, a little bit of anecdote from i think you know edo and i both resonate on this next slide which is, uh, you know, really about you see this fusion between the physical world and the, the digital bits. And I think, you know, when I, I grew up in Jamaica uh, and I had awesome construction sets, Edo had similar toys that were the Lego blocks, the Meccanos, the Erector sets that sort of built our creative confidence. And then what was interesting at that time was things like, I don't know who, if we have some fans of Will Wright and SimCity, you know, I grew up playing these really pixelated, you know, in the 80s uh, uh, sandbox games that opened my eyes to the to this world that the digital world can be an awesome place also to build modularly and playfully and use imagination. Um, so we'll show a little bit of that with with Patch um, in how we're thinking about the, this digital world as sort of the new <laughs> <laughs> new playground uh, and, and, and Edo's got some awesome demos to show. Yeah, I think for me it was more like Age of Empires, the world editor, and but it was very similar things. That's two moments like the, the first time you build something bigger than yourself by connecting these blocks like in Lego and also when you get to share that experience with others. So, so, so those are some of the things that really uh, we are trying to to polish and enhance now with the tools that are available today. So you are not limited by the size of the bucket where you keep your blocks, but more about your ingenuity and the curiosity and the time that you have. Yeah. So, and that beautiful thing is we'll show you our one envisionment of a world. Imagine that everyone, no matter where you are in Mexico, in Jamaica, in the US, um, everyone has access to a headset that's a portal into this uh, digital world where it's not going to cost you money. You're not limited in how many physical blocks or the physical physics. Uh, and so patch world is this expression. Uh, maybe we can just roll the clip and you get a little taste of what's, uh, what we've built there. No, whenever I start with it, then. Mm -hmm. 
Hey, what are you doing? The show is about to start. Come on, let's go. Whee! Thanks for that. Uh, depending on your bandwidth, it, it, the video may show up in a choppy way. So I'd encourage you, if it was choppy for you, uh, you know, you go to the Oculus uh, Store and Search Patch World and you could see it in its full glory. Um, we have some screen pulls of this uh, next just to uh, sort of highlight a couple of things, um, you know, which is really about when we think about what is the future here of creating, you know, we have this musical domain, but what we wanted to show here was three things sort of you know, a playful side of prototyping, right? Um, focusing on making it really easy for people to express the idea that it is that they have in their head radically, like, like a musical instrument. Um, and then, you know, this value of doing it together and sharing and being open, you know, th these are the values we've chosen our point of view, right? And that's built into the tool and the design choices we made. Um, so we'll show a little bit about how that, uh, how that sort of shows up in, in, in how we are, we're building. Um, but this is, you know, how we feel the future is going. Um, and if we go next slide. Um, so you can see a few screen grabs in terms of like, uh, one of the first things you see when you load up patch world, this is what you're greeted with, right? It's a playful. Yeah, so object. maybe, hmm. maybe something to mention here is that, uh, what we are releasing right now, we are dividing in chapters. That we call EPs inspired by music, but for us, extended play is a little bit more. It's like a it's like a pack where you have a set of instruments that are themed for a music uh, type, genre and space. So if you think about them as Lego packs, uh, you can have like the, here is the underwater world where you can go and explore reggae, and you have instruments that look like this. And the reason we are showing this is because we are like this playful approach also uh, favors fantasy. So we are not really trying to replicate what exists right now or trying to go over for, you can do that using the same principles, but you can also take it and reimagine what music looks like for you. Uh, so then there's three, three of these packs and the idea is to keep uh, expanding the possibilities, exploring different functionalities as the technology and as the platform grows with more people and so on. Sorry, Joe, but back to and, you. and it's a great point to, to um, showcase at least the strategy we're taking is more like the Lego mindset, where here is this playset, here's something fantastical that gives you some inspiration and some spark and some confidence to go to the next step instead of jumping directly into the uh, the uh, let's say the woes of unity or unreal, you know, we feel like it's really important to show something very quickly, like right in the front door that just says play and inspiration up front. Uh, and this is a, you know, a technique teachers use a lot with younger children. We have to catch the attention. And so I think, uh, yeah, this is a screenshot from one of the uh, kinetic <laughs> EPs. Uh, yeah, so, so some of these are playing, uh, like you can make music uh, by using gravity, for example. So here you have rains and you have physical models that are blocks. So the simulated sound generators like pans, strings we will show you and then you can put them into into space and use gravity as your timeline so that way you start really start playing with some of these concepts that you can translate to other uh, things but but from playing to working is a really nice uh, dance i guess awesome and yeah so th th like and using the same principles you can get into more uh, conventional settings 
and uh, by combining these blocks. So we we didn't make uh, uh, these these objects like hard coded. We just had like the what we call these digital circuits or like these build, low level building blocks like a slider or or a knob, and then you, uh, very advanced users are combining to make these offers. But this is fully open, so you can eventually will be able to open them up, remix them, uh, change them, and make them yours or make your own, for example. And what I love about this image is, you know, you can start to see the atoms or the building blocks that, you know, we we made some choices for the users about, hey, these are important blocks that we think you're going to use often, knobs and switches and buttons and pads. Um, and so when we have a, a low code environment that users don't have to jump into the unity or code to do the quick interactions, you know, I love this image because it's an example of what people can create without jumping outside of the headset. Yeah, so, and, and that, that part is uh, this, this philosophy of development is very inspired by music, because if you think about music creation, like in this case, you don't need to be a musician, but we want you to prototype like musicians play music. Like uh, it's a very specific medium because when you are, like let's say you plug a string or you hit a drum, you are not only creating something, but you're also consuming it and sharing it with others in the same feedback loop. Very different than when you make a painting or code, like you just do that and then you show it. So, so the, the, the loop of iteration is very different. And our, uh, yeah, our thesis is why could you not create in that way? Why could you not be doing these iteration loops in a, like uh, between discovery, uh, invention and testing, get that tight loop like a jazz drummer will be reacting to the bass player. So that's basically, uh, yeah, our kind of path of exploration. And maybe in this one, as the same, uh, like uh, this is very domain specific of XR. Uh, how are we going to interact with this, uh, with space? How are you going to use gesture that feels physical, but don't, but has the uh, limitless possibilities of software? So, for example, a slider like this would be pretty difficult to do in, 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 the, in the real world. But if it feels physical, you can get very playful and then you can start designing very sophisticated devices that otherwise would be very difficult to you need to go into the wonderful uh, the space of quaternions and uh, spend a few months or years getting into that and then maybe uh, even start thinking about this but here you can do it during the first uh, days of playing with the with the system and this gift shows a beautiful example at least in our domain we care about interaction, rich interaction across, you know, music, across visuals, haptics, uh, motion. And so, you know, the things involved in prototyping this interaction really cross over more than just audio. And so what we realize is that when we're prototyping, we really need to be quickly seeing these changes across all these senses in real time, in our headset, uh, tweaking things until you can get, um, you know, something like you see here. And I just love that this drop is actually a physical, <laughs> you know physical you physically drop the uh this very mutable uh moldable object which is uh some beautiful shader work from our team uh yeah and then uh, we are gonna jump uh, soon enough to show you a bit of these principles but here it's also encapsulated the three pillars of of the philosophy behind our uh, our blocks or our framework which is driven by sound and but also the integration of the visuals and the gesture in real time. So this is a, the, 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 uh, it's, it's not a general uh, like uh, language, but it focus on the on the on making that integration as easy and as powerful as possible. Because then you can go and connect, uh, yeah, these elements at different layers of control. Um, cool. So let's say you're, imagine you're just starting out and you have this beautiful uh, insert idea here of thing we want to do in XR. Um, but let's just set the baseline. Where are we today, right? If, if you really are just starting. Um, and so for many of us, uh, we have some uh, uh, ideas, but let's just start uh, 
with the simplest idea we can imagine. Um, there's a great thing on App Lab called uh, the Unity Cube that uh, Scarred Ghost managed to get up there. I found that hilarious. Um, but let's say you just want to get a simple cube uh, in your headset. Um, it's a technique I learned working with kids, which is to just take like the hello world and uh, take a stopwatch and uh, hit go and see what happens uh, with different users. Um, and so for many of us uh, who have been building an XR, if we go to the next slide, this, this will seem very familiar, uh, which is a sample from uh, Justin Barnett's YouTube channel. <laughs> Added up uh, uh, about 20X. Um, in actuality, if you wanna get a cube in VR starting from scratch, you know, you're opening up Unity, we are going through a lot of settings. This is using the new XR plug, plugin management. If you're using Unity 2021, uh, we're pulling in uh, the XR Interaction Toolkit. If you want to do uh, teleportation, quick turn, if you want to use the hard work that the Unity team's done for getting fast into interactions, and so on and so forth. So, so I think you know this video is probably to get started before we even get to a cube. Um, oh, there we go. You know, putting in the XR rig, putting in the uh, camera controls uh, there, you know, I think the point here that we've all gone through is before you actually even get something in the headset, there's a large lag in time. And so we want to ideally reduce the simple things like getting uh, basic interactions to be immediate and in the headset um, without this sort of upfront cost. And of course, dev teams over time learn how to sh shorten this time with templates and so on. But um, I think uh, similarly in Unreal Engine and other game engines, uh, this lag is really a problem for the way we work. Um, so we do use the game engines to get the, the power and speed of doing very complex things. Um, but remember, we're focusing on simple ideas here. <laughs> Has he gotten a cube there? I don't think he's gotten it built yet in an APK on his headset. So, all right, so it takes a while. Um, let's move to the 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 next context. And, you know, if you are trying to shorten your prototyping speed, you know, you know, shout out a couple of these people, we could talk about it more in the Q and A, depending on your domain um, there, you know, if you're doing sketching uh, and sculpting and so on, things like tilt brush, now open brush, open source are great places that beginners can start and get to express their ideas. Um, dreams on the PlayStation and media molecule. I really love that team. It's done a really awesome job on design work. Um, and, you know, as we look to the future, large companies like Meta, formerly Facebook, you know, have a great platform because they touch so many people socially, you know, and they're also paying attention to the power of creator tools. Um, so depending on your domain, we can get more into it, into the, into the chat. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are tools out there that you can use and there's great design work that's happened beforehand. Unity Labs did, with Timony West did some awesome, design works just thinking, well, how far can we go if we just keep the headset on? Uh, and you can try out their, their version of that that's uh, open source on GitHub. Um, so, you know, people have tried many, uh, many approaches for our domain. Maybe we go to the next slide. We'll, we'll share a few, uh, few ways. We had to build our own sort of tools because we felt that none of the tools out there sort of met exactly our uh, our uh, prototyping needs, um, but a great place to start for you all is really benchmarking those tools that already exist that maybe express some of the things you need already. If you need to sculpt something, maybe pulling up Gravity Sketch on your uh, Oculus Quest is a great way to start if what you're trying to do is create a form. Uh, there's a great article last week uh, about the Walkabout Mini Golf uh, team that they use Gravity Sketch for prototyping their levels, and that's awesome. Um, and so, how do we prototype? Well, maybe we'll go to the next slide. Uh, you know, I think this is really encapsulating the mindset of how we're doing it in our domain, which is to think more like a child, to think more like what do we have at hand? And, uh, uh, and if we have a simple musical idea, like making a guitar out of a shoe box uh, and some rubber bands uh, to test, you know, is the size right? Is the sound right? Is the, um, is the gesture right? Uh, this I think is, you know, our sort of philosophy. So, so we're going to uh, try something a little bit. Uh, uh, we just pushed an update. So uh, forgive our rough edges. Uh, Edo is going to show live uh, a few things yeah. just building in the tool. Yeah, we're going to keep it jazzy. Um, it's also, if there's something specific, uh, just let us know. I'm happy to show you. So, uh, oh. 
there's yeah. uh, there's uh, like uh, again uh, just to the stuff that we are making and some of the things that we're going to show you still not available but we had to build it before we could, we could give you what is uh, available today so they the goal is to make anything everything inside vr so the world is built from the ground up in the headset that means that you can also break it down in the headset uh, and it's, uh, it's available in real time. So you can open it up. There's no compilation. There's, uh, there's this uh, simulation that you can just access all the different layers and modify them and hear or see the reactions in real time. And to no code, but you can go, you can start in a Lego-like experience, very high level, very playful, but you can start opening these things up and going to like a, low code or the equivalent of virtual circuits and make it together. So right now it's still not available, but we're, we've been having amazing uh, surprises with our prototypes on, on multiplayer. And this is actually the goal that we are really striving towards, like allow this collaboration. And we believe by having this, these three ingredients, the ideas and the content that is going to be created, the stories that we're going to tell are going to be very different because it's not going to require these long iteration uh, frames and, and, and not only uh, limit this creativity for a very high technical uh, people, but you will be able to start making more kind of improvisations in, so, in such a yeah, wonderful medium. So I'm going to jump into it. But in the meantime, we're going to show you some of the latest uh, creation so uh, and then if i if it takes me a little bit longer joel you can say tell a joke or something <laughs> you're just gonna get the headset on sure just give it a uh, musical devices made with this mindset right you left the headsets on feel you glue them on you don't take them off uh, uh, make weak the audio and the gesture right in the headset um, and as we're iterating, we're often doing like this on Slack or video. We're doing it together, casting often. Uh, John, can you end it lower the music because we cannot hear you? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Let's do that. And so. Excellent. Thanks. Actually, I want to out for those of you who know Roland uh, 303. And I love one of our power users. It's sort of drag some blocks together and uh, you know, built on top of the audio engine because in real time you can. Uh, uh, so are making replicas of things they might be familiar with in the, in the physical world. Yeah, so something to, because all the software and hardware that makes the, the electronic music today is based on the same principles. It's just combined in very clever ways. So uh, I'm just going to jump out to the yeah. to the demos. <laughs> and uh, and that has been our, our entry point to really find those. Uh, OK, I stopped the casting, so sorry about that. Uh, to start with these principles and combine them in some clever ways, but also keep that path open for others to recombine them and and make their own versions. So we, we are aiming to see this the like familiar ideas, but also new ideas following this. Uh, following this uh, this approach so we're gonna start from uh, like a lower level and then let me know joel i'm gonna put the the, the sound a little bit low so it doesn't mm -hmm. drive me crazy with the delay so I have headphones but uh but yeah but then you can make a sign <laughs> to have okay. somebody here to come. awesome so we'll mime our uh, a little prototyping session me and you i know what, what are we building today uh, so, we're, for example, this is a already made guitar that starts with a few blocks. So we're gonna show. Uh, do, do we have sound? Yep, we're hearing sound. That's great. Okay, cool. 
Right. So this with this, we start. Uh, one, uh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, that's a uh, that's one of the versions Gad made recently. So this is awesome. You pulled that in uh, today. Yeah. So so this is that. some of the new updates that we are playing with, and uh, this is already a, a made uh, instrument, but it's made out of blocks. So everything here is modular, and you have things like generators, guitar that you can change. So everything can be break apart and can be modified to affect different elements and be recombined. So here is something that we're exploring that we're calling like this uh, the state machine. So I'm gonna show you how the like the process of building such uh, an experience here or such a, a device. So we start with so, yeah, some like a very like a, a generator for sound, but we can start adding interfaces. Like for example, these are values. This is where I start getting, uh, so you can combine these things. So, so this is a patch. Uh, it's inspired by modular synthesizers where you can start uh, dragging wires to build connections. So if I can grab it, I can connect it to the, to the string. And if I hit this, it changes the size and also the sound. So I can grab another one. And oh, I just hit the lamp. Uh, and and following the same ideas, we can start layering these things together to, to add more with one hit add more of this interaction. So I'm just gonna go to this so you can see. So it's the same uh, approach, the blocks are there and now we have chords. So every time I hit this, all these objects are connected to the strings and this is basically how we have built a whole uh, yeah, everything in patchwork. So we start with the, some principles. We start finding interactions. We start giving controls. And at the very end, we give them a body. So here now we have a basic guitar, but maybe this is not the right play, the way to play a, a guitar in VR. So, so somebody could come in and start uh, adding uh, new elements to it or use a guitar that is already great and start uh, changing the world around it for you. So you have this editor that is fully integrated with the world. So uh, we are not compiling a new world. It's just like, a, it's more closer to HTML. So it's just a reference of the, the all the, the blocks that create that universe that where you're in. And you can add elements to it or mix them. So. For example, we have the, the layer of devices. I can get a device that makes different things like this one, that it will change the color of my background. And I have uh, also a nice or a different type of, of interface that will be difficult to prototype. And it's very natural in VR, so it's a 3D slider. If I go up and down, is the value, left and right is the color and back and forward is the saturation. So let's just get into like a dark thing. And this is another one, like just to, to get a, uh, like an audiovisual experience. I will show you some of the stuff that I was prototyping right now. Party cool, it's really like pretty serious. Uh, so this one is uh, it's a particle generator that has different elements so that the has a state so we can make a make the make different colors start changing the the look and i save a few presets here so we can change the way that the world looks like so i spent a little bit of time tweaking the stuff but here you can see how i'm changing them with the upcoming preset manager. So I just save the state, that's cool. And I make a button 
and that just swaps them. But now let's say that whenever I hit this score, I want this thing to happen. So I can just drag my wire again and uh, oh. So you can see now the yeah the wires here and uh, I will also one this one and this one so. So you can start layering these actions and start building your your world uh, and connecting these things uh, as 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 you see fit. So in the in another setting, you can also start adding your you can start also access, accessing other worlds that are pre-made and adding view recording. So you don't need to start building from scratch. You can build from scratch. So let's say this is some of the, the, it's combining different elements that you will find like the, in this Lego block. And something that we are really excited about is the way to record your actions. So I can open my recording switch and I get a, a, a button here to start recording. So layering your actions and not be limited to what you can do at one time, start making your own. context we call this the, the ghost recordings that's a quick way for us to record our physical actions and they actually interface with the the instruments and so that way we can leave messages for each other to show how we want how we sort of play the instruments how something might be used or to share ideas asynchronously but not everything needs to be like so avant-garde and experimental that we are really exploring that like so we are building this uh, uh, this uh, these experiences, but we want to teach to how the yeah the the devices that have made history of music or interaction how are they built? So we give you fantastic stuff, but we want to teach you how to build stuff that you already know. So eventually, you can decide where to go. Uh, for example, these drum machines are one of the these packs that we release. It's a uh, bouncy beats, and what we can see here is playing with the interaction. But to get to this point,
So whenever we do an instrument, we figure out new interfaces, we find sound generators, and then we put them into a world and see how the sounds and the dishes will connect by exploring different types of interactions. But the goal is that because this is virtual, even though you, you play it physical, you will be able to take that, break it apart and start making new ideas and share that with others and remix them. And yeah, we have this, this uh, wonderful space for, for creativity. So that's uh, a little bit on the philosophy and the current state of things. The next step will be having people uh, coming in together and playing with you. So uh, thank you. I'm going to get back to the real world, but I'm happy to show some other things uh, if something was not clear. Um, a uh, virtual round of applause for our uh, <laughs> our patch master, Edo, uh, doing the live demo. That was awesome. Um, <laughs> and so just, just to reiterate, these are the internal tools that we're using uh, today uh, to, to prototype. Um, of course, some things are very simple, like we saw making a, a simple guitar. Uh, some things are more complex, like you saw it right there at the end um, that has more, more complexity in its wiring. And so uh, it's just to show you guys so you can see very concretely that, um, you know, what we're using internally, um, sharing that. We're very uh -huh. curious about what you all are, uh, <laughs> what you all are doing uh, internally too. Um, uh, and you know, maybe we could. Uh... I'm going back to to sharing the screen. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. sorry. And so you know, and, and as he's pulling that up, you, you know, some reflections we can go into more detail depending on um, what, uh, what what you're more interested in. Um, but I think what was really cool is to show a the headset stayed on. We glued it on. We were able to show some simple interactions. We we're able to show some complex interactions. Um, uh, you saw the loading screen there. We're pulling in assets dynamically from the web, right? Instead of going to Unity and doing a traditional compile workflow. Um, and we're pulling in assets from different teammates. So some of what we're showing there um, is as we're working, somebody will say, hey, what do you think about this way to, to express a guitar, which was awesome to, to then download it, play through it, and then we could show it um, you know, to other members and iterate. Um, and while always staying sort of in this playful mode, always maintaining the, the mindset of a musician, right? Like with sort of expression at your fingertips, if I wanted to make an interaction like Edo showed, when I play the guitar, I want to have some particles that are different for one chord versus the G chord versus the C chord. And you could see that that interaction was him just drawing a, a wire to express that one idea. So for a single idea or interaction, it's a simple sort of uh, connection within the world as opposed to a whole recompile an APK and upload to the headset. Uh, and then you could see that we're or, or a meeting a meeting across departments where the technical team needs to talk to the creative team that needs to be approved by the story team. Here you just can prototype that and see if that makes sense. Yeah, and we're doing this in like a super open fashion. I mean, we're comfortable here opening up the hood and saying, look, here's how our engines working. Um, you know, sharing on a sort of uh, face to face or video conference like this. Um, so I think this this sort of loop maintaining these sort of uh, ideas has been super useful for us to, to build what you see there in patch world. Um, so I think we're going into Q&A. So just to maybe reiterate, we, we showed a couple uh, mindsets that we think are useful for everyone who's making an XR. So if you and your domain and whatever you're building are um, wanting to speed up your prototyping, would highly encourage you to uh, try these techniques to keep the headset on until uh, something breaks and then build the tools that you need to sort of maintain that iteration loop, um, uh, keeping everything real time as possible for the prototyping sort of focus. And then, you know, thinking open, thinking social, doing, doing these things together um, in real time is sort of a, a good mindset mm -hmm. that push us. And also, uh, not necessarily in real time, but being part of a community. So at the moment, some of the more advanced tools are still not available. But if some of you are comfortable in this domain and are interested in exploring this type of things, please apply for the beta because we are we are really have a community of creators. And the, the, goal, the whole point is to shape these possibilities together. So 
yeah if you want to go to another level <laughs> yeah yeah, on the next slide, you can hit us up on Discord. Um, try out Patch World on Quest. It's a good next. These are some biased next steps. Give it a try. Search Patch World on the Quest Store. Uh, it's our point of view, just one point of view. Uh, and uh, you know, on your end, I think you know, iterating your workflow, depending on some new ideas you might get from that. Um, go to our Discord. Uh, connect with us. If we go to the next slide, um, you can get see our contacts. Um, a lot of what you see here with some great uh, creative direction from, from Melody. Uh, we saw some awesome content in these videos uh, led by Gad. So just a shout out uh, to those other co-founders. Uh, QR codes there in the Discord. Um, you can see our contacts there. You can, um, we have a program for the, for the intrepid patch makers to uh, apply for pa patch makers to use our internal tools actually to help us improve it. Um, uh, so that is... Uh, We'd love your feedback and we'd love you to sort of um, dog food our, uh, our point of view so we can improve and, and hopefully, you, you know, you all can improve your own uh, prototyping flows. And, um, so I think with that, uh, we're in the, you know, op open and I think Ian's going to moderate some questions. I see a lot of questions have been coming in. Yes, um, we have many questions. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> sorry for the going over maybe on time, but uh, no, pretty... no, no worries at all. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was a great demo. It, it's fantastic to see it like iterate live and, and 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 pull it out. We can get right into some of the like we do have many questions available here, and we can get right into some of them. Um, one of them, uh, a couple of different people are asking about the um, aesthetics of Patch World, um, and you were mentioning Melody is like the creator directory. But do you have any? Could you speak at all to like how you developed the the visual style of this of this experience mm. um how you came to the aesthetic well uh, i think there's uh, already a tendency once you try to combine sounds and visuals that goes towards the psychedelic uh, approach because that's just part of the but the goal on the style is to actually to not have a style this is it's a it's a combination of principles and eventually we have users uploading their own meshes and their own uh, things, so so they are making very different things. Uh, so at the moment, the style is just uh, exploring. It's like a based on layers. So we, again, it's, it's on the workflow. We start with interaction, then we start seeing the connections and how do we want to visualize that the that sonification that is happening, and it's a more of an emerging, uh, yeah, an emerging process. And I will say, I mean. When we do have a choice to make visually, uh, we bias towards the thing that is gonna give this feeling of playfulness. Um, so in, in the defaults that we do have, you know, we want everything to feel um, inspirational, right? Uh, on one hand, and on the other hand, we want it to feel modifiable. You'll notice a lot of things in here as you approach them and touch them and move them, uh, they'll morph, they'll dent. Uh, uh, they'll react to what you're doing. And so not just in how it looks statically, I think also is important the feeling of, can I reach out and put a dent in this universe? And so I think um, for almost every object we have, it's gonna react to you in some way, whether visually, audibly, um, someone I think was in the, mentioning haptics in the comments. Um, you know, we've, if you touch something, you hit a pad, it's going, you're going to feel it, you're gonna hear it and you're gonna see it. Um, maybe one day you can smell it. Uh, and so I think art style wise, it's synesthetic, it's sort of biased towards playfulness, like we, like we, uh, sort of showed in our, in our core values, um, and, uh, biased towards modifiability, showing the affordance of, Hey, I can be moved. I can be modified. Fantastic. So that's the, that's the, the graphical side of things. One of the pieces that I'm interested in, and also other people are interested in is the kind of tooling that you've created here. So this, this is made in Unity, um, mm. but then you've created your own, um, like uh, the audio tools in Unity are like, okay, but this goes yeah. far beyond that. So could you speak some to like yeah. the kind of the heart of the system going on here? Cause you're really engineering sound live. Like uh, it's one thing to be able to walk up to um, something. Like if you had a, a, a physical control, some sort of, um, digital work workstation for doing audio and just interacting with it on a surface level. But when you can flip over to edit mode and see all the wires and the connections and then go in and make your own changes, 
that's like incredibly powerful. Can you speak yeah. a little bit more to how you develop that system or the underlying workings that are happening there? Yeah, well, I'm sure Edo, Edo can go on about this for a whole other session, especially for um, those who are really deep into the audio side. What, what, I, what I will say here from a tooling perspective is um, especially performance, right? Having an audio engine that is dynamic and flexible like this did require us to go in and write um, relatively complex audio code uh, at the low level to get the performance and the reactivity that you're seeing there. Um, as, a, as a tip for others who maybe are doing similar things or related um, when they need that power, at least what we found was um, there's low level C++ code, right? That's doing um, the audio engine. And that is bridged to Unity, right? With some, you know, uh, callbacks for things that we use often. Um, and so I think an a good architecture that we found works for us is to make sure when we're prototyping, we're not having to recompile our engine. We ha always have a bridge to the, um, to the visual tool that we're doing the interaction in. And so in that moment, um, let's say if you need the performance bridge over to something that is optimized and performant. Um, and so, you know, uh, yes, this tool is built on top of Unity, but then for things that we're missing, um, you know, we've built those in and glued in just like the Lego blocks uh, bridges between. Uh, and so that in the moment when you're prototyping, you don't have to go hit compile. That's sort of the, the thing we're trying to have the mindset yeah. avoid. Yeah, and it's, it's like that like a language so you get the primary functions that you will need like math and uh, a speaker uh, and then some gen sound generators and then uh, it's all about how these things connect so every time you will make a connections the engine rebuilds those connections and and and, and takes care of the sound simulation and and yeah we, we use unity to export but we also like uh, yes, you mentioned the the sound and the the, the the interaction part on Unity, especially since we started, it was not so much the focus. So so it slowly was like a series of happy accidents in relationship with very talented people that end up telling like forcing us to make our own solution. And uh, yeah, but uh, but uh, as Joel mentioned, it was all about like after you develop in VR for some years. Then you start getting this carpus, like a, this kind of motion. So it was all about getting this uh, this flapping around to 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 be less basically. Yeah. So um, with tooling, I'd say as a just as a hint, sorry. And it's like <clears throat> if you find yourself doing this all the time, it's a hint that that it might be worth putting the effort to tooling, and it is effort. Um, but we, uh, you know. We, we know that feeling when we're like, okay, this is something that is worthwhile investing some um, some tooling so we don't have to, you know, recompile, avoiding the recompile at all costs. <laughs> um, yes. I recommend that we answer quickly because we have 36 more questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. Perfect. So yeah. I actually uh, just talked with our team, I think, for the most interesting question, we would give maybe one patchwork game code. So uh, I'm sure that most of the people already downloaded who are already curious, but we would like to also encourage uh, questions. And I will also invite some of our students graduates. So we may even take some of the questions in a video format or uh, they can directly ask here. So Ian, maybe you can a little bit combine some of the questions so we can at least finish some of them. Yes. Um, a couple different people had asked this and you had just mentioned it briefly. Is there any way to export out from the creations that you make in patch world to be able to like use else world? It... Uh, yes. So you can, you can export the sound, but we also been, uh, we still not a public, but we've been successfully integrating patches into the blueprint uh, engine on Unreal and like uh, because of the modularity of the engine you can, you can do some of these things but still not a bit wow yeah and i'd say we you know be because we've done this work to define this architecture patches are defined quite you know compactly as uh as its own sort of um uh, simple script and so those are shareable and um you know they're just short uh 
uh, scripts that describe a graph of computation. Um, this block connects to this block, right? Connects to this block. Um, and something that like uh, we have had uh, creators uh, just exporting, like uh, we've been doing it more in collaboration with the, sorry, the motorcycle people, uh, like where we just make a special build and they've been showcasing on festivals where then it's, it's a undistinguishable form, uh, like standalone experience, because the only thing it does is just opens directly that experience. So it's, 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 it's still running in the engine, but it's export to, <laughs> for, for that matter. Um. And maybe I know we need to be fast, but also there's always C integration as well. So there's a lot of people integrating their own workflow and sending this event data uh, through OSC to control their own things in Ableton or their own games or installations. So that's also a lot of that going on. Um, yeah, one of the thing, one of the other questions that I think could tie into that is, um, I believe there might be some music teachers in the chat who are wondering, like, how could we use this to engage in education, like educating about music better? And like recently in playing that, I like I'm I work with music a little bit, but there's some mystery once you go, like I was saying, like once you go inside of a box, you don't really know what's going on in there. What's incredible about this is it gives anyone the opportunity to open them up and modify and make creations. Are there some ways that you envision that other people could use this to um, not just be creative, but teach using this tool? You know, what I can say as an educator, you know, I teach uh, courses at Stanford as adjunct faculty as well. And Spent a lot of time working with kids in K twelve on uh, on previous uh, startups. Um, you know, I think what we've learned with Patch that music is universal. You know, I grew up uh, in Jamaica. Our heroes were you know Bob Marley, and uh, music is on every corner. And so, no matter where I was in the world, everybody could connect with me on that level. Um, so, I think as an educational tool, not just for music, I think it's a gateway into understanding um how to create in the world right um so so yes i think it's it's exciting for those who are into music theory i think we were i was just in patch um you saw that string that edo was uh playing with and we use numbers right to represent um you, you know the music at least in that demo and it got me thinking about the theory that i had done as a child doing piano lessons and intervals and you know, what's a major chord and a minor chord and to see it in a different form that I could reach out and touch uh, as an alternative to traditional sheet music uh, was personally very powerful for me to that idea of opening the hood and uh, seeing what's going on at the low level. So I think we're just scratching the surface of, um, you know, this as an educational tool. You know, I think first we want to make sure we're exciting people to come into the world and then start building. Um, and uh, uh, I think over time, but you know it would be great if this was something that every student in high school or younger actually gets the experience of building some personal device that they uh, uh, that they care about uh, and then being informed by some expert teacher that's uh, you know in combination. So I think there's lots of potential for 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 that over over time. Hmm. And in a similar vein of thinking of you were saying that you, there's different ways to rec represent this kind of theory. And you're also talking about building up these blocks, this, this vocabulary of blocks that they might use most often. We have a really interesting question here from um, Mehmet, Mehmet that's a, uh, so some of the interaction interfaces in patch world are, are really interesting and they have the, um, they're based on kind of our, our analog world design that we already have of faders and knobs and dials. Do you have any plans or any ideas on how you could rethink those interactions for something that isn't totally possible? There's mm. some experimentation of like the uh, the booper and the um, I'm trying to remember the name the flooper, the one that you pull on like a like an instrument. Um, but do you have any other thoughts along those lines about like Patch World does a little bit of that, but breaking away from the traditional sense and using the 3D space for making things that you yeah. couldn't make anywhere else. Yeah, uh, actually, there's a lot of experimentation there. So, the, like again, we we release these three chapters uh, that are more polished worlds that, are like, okay, imagine you could do things like that. But now we're going back into the drawing board and giving <clears throat> more of these low-level blocks. And some of these low-level blocks are 
interaction blocks that take uh, the, the speed onto account and then you, you output the speed as a value. You can, you can see if you are inside of that world. So you can start playing with your position, your gestures, and, uh, and then use that to control the information. But uh, what we notice is that at this stage on the VR development and, and in general for the general public, it's also good to give some uh, entry point where you have something familiar uh, to, to then start dreaming about something super fantastic. Yeah, and I think one thing that's great about, like you might ask, well, why VR, for example? There's there's things that um, Edo even showed in the demo with changing the background that, yes, we could use a simple slider to change a background color, but in a spatial setting, we have the um, multiple dimensions. We have a six degree of freedom controller and he showed there a slider that was in 3D to change the hue, saturation, and value. Uh, that's not something I think I've ever seen in the physical world. It's relatively quick and easy to and natural to do in the in this in a spatial environment in stereoscopic 3D. So we're finding that there are a class of instruments that do seem to apply much more naturally to these spatial worlds. Um, 3D slider is a great example, um, while at the same time having familiar things like that are universal. Everyone knows that a button is something you can bop and a toggle is something that has uh, binary states that switch and so on. Um, so we, we need those familiar things because they're so common. Um, and uh, yeah, you'll see many of the things in, in, in Patch World, we've, we've shown some examples of what you can do um, uh, with those extra dimensions. Um, and, yeah, even and using like, voice, for example, just like how you scream and high and so there's usually those more advanced interactions are a combination of these basic interactions yeah. yeah if you notice when he was showing the sequencer um in bouncy beats episode so yes it's a sequencer you're moving around and notes are playing but if you're higher above the instrument there's a different sound if you're lower if you're moving to the left and the right you know we're using space to modulate the sound that's inside of the patch um, and those are things I think beforehand, you know, maybe it would be, it wouldn't even come to mind unless you were in 3D seeing that it's reacting and is aware of uh, what your hands are doing. Thank you. Yeah. Very thorough. So kind of a um, rapid fire of like, we do still have a, a bunch of different questions. So, but to, to line up a group of them. So um, how many people built out Patchworld? Like how, how, what's the size of the team on this? Uh, well, it has been, it's growing now, uh, started. So now we are 13 people, nine in the development. And then now we are so, so, but, uh, but at the beginning, uh, the engine was built by me and another, uh, another person. And then we start having like people adding more things. So it was growing over time and, uh, in many different iterations so in rapid fire it doesn't take a big team to build this i think that's a real this is rel relative to the gorilla studios out there i think you can build incredible beautiful things quickly with with these this kind of mindset um so i think i'm really proud of uh uh what we've done as a small team small studio you can do it too <laughs> Well, so that's part of what people are asking. So when you were, this is, has to do with when you were getting started, what tools were you building up for? This is like kind of the, the, the series of questions. What mm. tools did you build up first? You were talking about your engine. And then also when you started building out, what strategies did you use for like incorporating user feedback as you were building and figuring out what really worked for your prototypes? What didn't this kind of like uh, meta sense of like, yes, you're, you're prototyping within your application that you've made but within your own company for your own product as, as you're building that out. And then also like advice that you would offer to some of these people who are just getting started or even considerations of if you were to go back and do this again, what things might you change? So getting started, um, advice for people who are getting started, hmm. what might you have done differently? Hindsight 2020. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I think that the, the main thing to have been doing differently, but most likely will not be talking about this today. We will have been making more small things and finish because we were uh, we were testing a lot in festivals and making prototypes. 
and some of them could have been different apps. The, the first idea was a garden of music where you can put sound sources in space and uh, trees will dance recording to the music. It was a sound visualizer. But then the sculptures, we start adding little little things to modify the sound that you could play. It was like, oh, it would be fantastic that you could build this, this thing. So it was a lot of iteration and, and exploration as we were falling in love with the medium. And so, so it was uh, many prototypes, tiny ideas, and then put it in the hands of people as soon as possible and see what was the most exciting part of what was the thing that was keeping you longer and getting even more ideas. So, so yeah, maybe the, then again, the, the thing we have been doing differently will have been keep that long trail as, as we even keep the exploration and the playfulness, but also ship the product and putting it out there. We have like a, a few, many versions that could have been products by themselves. Yeah, you know, and I think what I'd acknowledge starting out, um, well, A, I think a bias towards building stuff, as much stuff uh, and getting it in users' hands as quickly as possible, thinking smaller, right? Uh, a tiny device of a one string guitar, right? And getting that in someone's hands to see, is this, is this a usable interface? Is this the user interaction that I want? Um, from game is development, it <laughs> is it fun, right? Does it make, how does it make the user feel? You know, we look at people's faces, you know, we get really good at, you know, we can predict when we're gonna have a bounce uh, sort of 10 seconds before it happens because you, you know, you're looking at your users and have a more direct connection. So I think thinking more in tiny prototypes, bu building stuff, um, I think the XR Bootcamp team is awesome an awesome example of biasing towards these short courses where you, you know, you sort of build some small idea or a vertical slice uh, or a gray box prototype. You know, these are words from different industries. I think getting started small, um, not to be intimidated because like we showed, um, you know, you're, you're best off starting with an existing game engine if you want to hit the ground running. Um, and that's going to come with some intimidation to get started with and some upfront setup costs, which can, I see a lot of users sort of give up uh, early on. And that's part of what we're thinking about with patch world, which is to smooth that out. You know, it's not that we want everyone to be in patch world all the time building because we have a specific domain. Um, you know, I think of it more as a progression, like what's the first things that you do. So perhaps if the unity or unreal workflow makes your eyes glaze over, see what, see what other people have done about it. You know, we have a point of view and I showed some, uh, some of our favorite uh, XR creator tools. Um, you know, my standard intro into VR is to go into tilt brush and show what's possible in a few seconds. It, I still do that as like a, you know, for first time VR users, it's in my flow of demo. And so I think, you know, uh, just be aware it is, uh, a, a long road to mastery. And if you think of it like a muscle that you're exercising, that that mindset has helped and, you know, to start building and share what you built and do that loop that we're, uh, that we, uh, you know, recommend to sort of show me something small that's inspirational and, um, uh, and share it uh, and openly as, as soon as possible. But then sometimes don't listen to the first feedback. Sometimes you also <laughs> need to stay like a, yeah, it's okay to have vision and and then know. Okay, I need to just fix that before. The, the, like XR, sometimes you say go look, look to the right, and people look to the left, and and so you also need to. Uh, it's a sweet sweet balance there. That's yeah. it. Don't reinvent the wheel unless it needs to be. Feel free to have the courage to reinvent the wheel when you know. You really like wheels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you really like. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we have like about 10, 15 minutes left. So I'm gonna try real quick to go through some of these questions we may have already answered, but we can touch on them. Some people were wondering, so what uh, software did you use to make the models and the renderings in? Mm. People really like the the characters. I love Patchy, he's my favorite. Um, he's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> um, uh, well, uh, we use a lot of Blender actually, like, uh, and and a lot of shader work because of all this, uh, like a uh, shader and, and, and typing. So it's just a lot of the, the, the interactions, how things react to each other. So for example, the booper, it's uh, mainly shader work because that's like a lot of very sophisticated interactions that need to react to the hit and so on. Patchy is a modular uh, thing. So we did a, a bunch of pieces that have blend shapes and then we expose those parameters in patch so you can blend between states and, and 
pretty soon you are going to be able to connect that to your synth and make your eyes pop with the beats and things like that. So, so it's about, yeah, encapsulation and exposing the right parameters. But so Blender is awesome. Yeah, for detail modeling, you know, we, we you know, use traditional tools. Um, and But then something also to keep in mind for gray boxing, we don't need to jump into Blender or Maya or anything to, to block that out because it's at our fingertips, to, like you saw with the guitar. Hey, I want this body. I want this neck. Um, so I think you can get pretty far um, in the early stages of prototyping without even touching an outside tool. But when you do need that extra polish and refined interaction, then you know we pull in those models. Uh, um, so the other questions here being like, is everything set to a global beat? I, I think when I was playing it recently, there is like a dial yeah. that you provide. You can change the BPM of everything in the world. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's also a patch input. So you have a BPM state and you can just build your patch and make it dependent to that. So so depend on the patch, that's the, the answer. Okay. Yeah. Do you guys have any integration to work with uh, DAWs? digital audio workstations? Uh, we've been talking to a few. We talked to the, yeah, to, to some of the, the cool guys in the DIW domain, but because we were like, actually there's some of the questions on when do you, uh, when do you listen to the feedback and when do you go through your own? We wanted to really find this uh, entry point. Like we are more inspired by the guitar hero journey to make you feel, but as opposed to guitar hero, if you spend one year playing in patch, ideas that you will be able to make music. Uh, so we are entering into that point. So at the moment, the, the integrations are more OSC or custom by some of the users. We are now uh, really thinking of putting MIDI. Uh, and once we really finalize our toolkit, then we will go more into some uh, specific integrations just because we don't want to be to turn into the standards before we find our own. Yeah, and remember, um, well, so like I was pointing out, if you have open sound control, that's a, pa a pipe, a patch into whatever it is that your music software that you're using. Um, so we do have some some pipes there that if someone's an expert in uh, uh, their favorite software, they can do it. They often tend to be more professional. So it's just a point to highlight, um, just like with Unity, you know, we want people's first, their early experiences to be really, uh, playful and encouraging, um, confidence building to go to the next stage. And what, what you'll find with traditional DAW software, it looks very similar to that Unity time lapse that we showed earlier, where it, it can be like a bit much to jump in there um, for some kinds of people. So for, so for them, um, you know, we haven't uh, focused a ton on, on that bit because we find that by the time we're the kinds of people who know what a DAW is you know they, they maybe don't need the confidence boots that we're uh you know building into this playful experience as much and so you know can a seven-year-old do it you know we want to make sure we have that accessibility from the from the beginning so is there a bit can you speak a little bit to maybe like the core of like where you see this kind of fitting in of being like is it like this is something that you want to move it in the direct like is this going to be something that's a creator tool something for experimenting prototyping is this something that you want to see people like making whole concerts on um where does this like lie what do you have envisioned for kind of like the future of this what is like the most appealing aspect to you maybe personally hmm. yeah. well I, I believe that the xr will change the way we consume media and music will be part of it. Like immersive music is not going to be the same that we hear in Spotify today. So we want people to, to get this, like a, this expression and tell these stories that the medium allows you to make. So the, the goal or uh, our areas is you can access an endless stream of instruments or build your own if you have a better idea. Because people, are, when it comes to music, somebody sings in the shower, some of them play drums and somebody just listen on the, on the bus. They're all right. So the, the idea is to give that openness and opportunity for people to explore it, but also to create the spaces to invite your friends to experience it together. So, so we are really uh, entering into this immersive music domain and, and it's still to be defined. So we want to open it to a community of creators and, and give them the tools 
and the space to share these things together and to build a community around that. Yeah, and I think at a high level, some of the ideas that we have in the way that we create prototype um, these musical instruments, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that the good ideas sort of proliferate into other tools and other domains. Um, you know, we want this to be like a good example of if you want to build something interactive that's musical, uh, that's audio, visual, haptic in nature, that this is a really fast way for people to do it and, and to share socially, sort of have this sort of creation loop. Um, but I think at a larger level, it's really about setting setting the, the, the bar higher in how our expressive our tools are for creating. And I, I think at a high level, I would um, excited to sort of show this as a use case to help and sort of push the industry a bit higher and how easy it is for people to create, because as you can see, we have some work to do with the baseline, you know, uh, of starting with a, a traditional game engine that there's a gap that I think we're showing how it could be done in our domain. And I hope others sort of, um, uh, you know, take note and try, try to sort of push the bar um, in, in whatever their industries are. But, but music is a, it's a language and the idea is to build like this language for people to express themselves into this medium that is visual and is immersive and it's remixable. Yeah, musically, if you can build your own piano or your own guitar in, in a particular tool, it passes our creative Turing test, you know, <laughs> like, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> and you can build just about, so I guess a few people are asking about if there's uh, an SDK where they create their own modules or about getting like access to kind of like internal tools the best forum for that would be on the, the Discord. They could get in contact with you or possibly apply yeah, and apply, to the, apply to the bet. If you are not afraid of, of some uh, unfinished things, then you, 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 we have a beta waiting list. We're opening it slowly. So right now what is on, on the Quest has the finished worlds and more and more devices that we are using with our toolkit. And uh, But uh, the goal is to open the whole the whole uh, building tool on that platform as well. But because we are solving the multiplayer, some things are still changing to be able to, to do the latency ownership and how things like, uh, yeah, how things are gonna work. So, so we are slowly opening that up. So we don't need to break too many people's worlds, basically. Yeah, go to patchxr.com and there's a Discord link there. We'd love to, you know, yes, we want people to build modules like, you know, <laughs> Our, uh, our SDK, our first level SDK is come into patch world, get our, get our internal tools and build, build more stuff. And we'd love to see it. We can't give everyone access because we don't, as a small team, we don't have uh, as much time to, to deal with a huge volume. So that's why we have it uh, sort of uh, invite at the moment, but reach out. We'd love to hear. Fantastic. Um, we have whittled down the question list significantly, but I believe we also have a couple questions here from one of our panelists and graduates of XR Bootcamp, Joseph. Yes, thank you, Ian. Uh, thank you uh, both of you all for the, the presentation so far. It's been very informative and very good and love to see projects like this be able to come about. The, the two questions I had, the first one being um, what you were talking about in terms of providing tools and having tools to be able to quickly put prototypes together instead of you know, necessarily going straight to code so you can just you know, imagine and get something together. Um, what problem I faced, and I think maybe others face, and maybe you can try to help out with that, is the people that do are more familiar with the code or have worked in the code, trying to get over that hump of, do I really want to invest the time to learn this new tool? Uh, or do I just want to go ahead and do it in the code? You know, that, you know, it, in the long run, it's better, but there's that kind of initial hump. Um, do you have any advice for like trying to just push past that, that initial trepidation? Mm. Yeah, I think it's a lot of what we were showing in, in, in these examples. If, if we do something frequently, that's a signal to us that it may be worth jumping, doing the jump. Uh, I mean, for those of us who are very fluent with code, sometimes you can do it faster in code. Although, uh, so I, I have a rule I call the seven, it's a seven second rule. And so if we have a new tool like Unity or so on, I'm just like, let's get a cube in there and let's start the stopwatch and see how long it takes. I would challenge any developer to start from fresh, a fresh quest and get a cube built in an APK in under seven seconds. 
it is possible with different sort of um, tooling, but that's uh, a good signal is what's important to you to have at your fingertips, like thinking like a musician and, and that will sort of tell you when it's worth making the hump. If you can do it faster in code, that's awesome, right? But there are just some things that are more naturally done um, uh, you know, outside of that domain, like the domain of interactions and reactions in audio, visual, haptic realm that you sort of need to feel it. You sort of need to do it in the moment, I think, as a bias. Um, so, I, so I don't think it's a hard and fast. I think you got to just sort of pay attention to what's important to you. Make the jump when you feel those signals. If you feel that you're pulling off the headset or if you feel that um, it could be done, um, uh, it needs to be done like at the fingertips, right? Writing some code to have a, a block spawn that's important to you. Like if you're, I love your Unity cubes in the background. <laughs> if you're making a cube world app and it's all about making cubes, then it's worthwhile building the tooling to when I press a button that a cube shows up in the world because that's such an important uh, part of your cube world experience. <laughs> um, I don't know if that answers uh, answers your question, but it's something we grapple with every day, but we have these mindsets that help us uh, sort of know when's the right time. When, when in doubt, we, uh, we, try and, we try and write the code to, to, to prevent us from writing more code. That was, that was a great answer, thank you. Um, the other question I had was more of a uh, like question for the patch world or whatever else stuff. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with uh, Anna, um, Anna Music uh, from like back in the 1990s where they had the animated uh, music vi uh, videos with the, the, the devices yeah. and stuff like that. Is that something you might have in mind within like patch world that people will be able to create like anime and world or anime music uh, experiences or already kind of really make it in a, in a funkier way, but it's already possible. Like you can record yourself playing and then let people come in, but, but it's still, there's still some missing parts. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, thank you. That was the, the questions I had. So I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, not familiar with that with that that reference, but I'd say if you try patch rail and you build a you make a musical comp hit record on your quest uh, and uh, uh, yeah, you, you can you can record yeah. yourself instead of making a video, you record yourself playing with the instrument, and so then you can do that a few layers and come in. So it's, uh, it's, it's somehow uh, yeah connected to these early '90s music videos for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, just for the reference, for anyone who doesn't know, Anna Music um, was basically this. They focused on making animated videos that then were music based. But like the one they're really known for was like the Music Machine or something like that. And it was a bunch of balls popping out of the center of this thing and hitting various things while it spun around. So it was a matter of animations combined with music. And they mm. didn't know things like that. Um, you can still find them on YouTube or whatever, I think so. Cool. That was one of the first things people started doing with computer graphics. <laughs> well, thank and, you. Fantastic. We are just a little bit over time, but we only have a very small question list. So again, one last uh, push. Let's see if we can answer a few of these. Any reason why uh, Fernando asks, why did you choose to recreate the questions virtual? Uh, the re why did you choose to recreate the controllers virtually? Hmm. The controllers, meaning um, the visual, yeah, the interactors. It it feels good to like be able to you can point right in at a specific thing and and manipulate it very directly. Oh, as opposed to a one to one representation exactly of this uh, of this quest controller. Yeah, I believe that's the yeah. the the ask. Um, I mean, if that's a ask, but you know, for our domain, if uh, if you just represent this three D model as is, you'll notice the. You know, we have a model in there. It's custom customized for our domain. It gives us more precision. You know, you're thinking more like a magic wand. It's really important for selecting, for manipulating objects in a way that um, maybe isn't so clear if we just sort of have a one-to-one -one representation. Um, and it also allows us to add more context um, uh, to show up visually or, uh, you know, labeling. You know, yeah, so if you think about the and to the interfaces, when you hover on top of text input, the, the cursor changes. Or if you hover on top of a link, you get a little hand. So mm -hmm. some of the stuff that will come soon is also this contextual aspect that allows you to know what, what the uh, foreign says of the world. So it, it's important to have control over these things because that's actually 
in this world one of the ways that you are figuring out what's going on around you and what can you do with it fantastic um uh some other ones we have here uh so uh Pinaki is a, a pro they're working on a project to build out a vr module for people with special needs would you have any suggestions on what you could keep in mind for like developing an experience like this where possibly you may have users uh may even be autistic uh like being able to make an accessible experience for um people to enjoy yeah yeah i think um uh from an accessibility standpoint well certainly biased towards testing uh safe you know ethical testing as much as possible you know is is, is a really helpful bias when, when it when it makes sense um uh working with users at different extremes so for example um someone who has some musculoskeletal disabilities in my former life i was a prosthetic designer so this is a lot of what i was doing was how we design limbs for people are missing limbs um but what you find is that somebody who has sprained their ankle is on a spectrum towards someone who is sort of mi completely missing a limb in that their mobility is lessened and so if it's possible to test with your target uh users then and it's safe then that's quick doing that quickly helps you sort of refine what things you need to do accessibility wise um if that's not possible then finding users who are analogous to give you some sense of well are my is my control scheme going to work for this kind of user we have six off controllers at the moment we only need one hand in order to use um these interactions it's it's helpful if you're left hand right hand dominant um uh most apps use bimanual input um at the moment we're experimenting with different ways but that's a small accessibility bump um uh for someone who who might only have one controller maybe their battery died um or they actually literally only have one hand free um i'd say uh yeah bias towards testing in whichever way you can and, and there are other types of users that can give you anal analogous um but yeah don't don't design i think the biggest mistake i see in the accessibility world is designing for users without user input from that population if it's low vision you know users you've got to talk to some low vision user they need to give the feedback and say look this is working or not working and i think um yeah that, i think that's the most common uh uh feedback that I see in, in, in that world. Um, fantastic. So with the, yeah, we'll wrap these. So um, super quick, number one resource of that you might recommend to somebody for developing user experience or building, yeah, uh, like a good resource that you could be able to name? Oh, for user experiences in general? Uh, yeah, they ask also specifically in general to UI um, user interfaces and, and building mm -hmm. out this sort of system. Like, did you have any that you inspired the initial creation of this work? Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a pretty yeah. broad. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, it is. Yeah, uh, so, so we started also with this the, the, the information that you are dealing with. So we divide this, like, start taking in more like this mechanical metaphors so when you are moving the, the the values you can see what's happening in the world and then we have also this uh, electronics uh, electric uh, like with, with the wires so you can see the control and start figuring these things out and we've been looking a lot about physical world like from cars to uh, like the, the uh, like <laughs> i was looking at these planes and all these things that are made for utilitarian purposes when you enter a plane how does it look with like the thing that opens the door because those are already well taught interactions that immediately we figure out like a way like you can see a door you see the the, the hinge you you will immediately think that this can be open so we were trying to make it as physical as possible but also to not just limit it to the physicalities of that metaphor and i can add that i mean uh well, Ed brings up a great point that if you're looking for ideas usability wise, uh, the physical war, if we have thousands of years of experience with musical instrument interfaces and other physical interfaces. So you want to draw from things that we know uh, 
uh, have been around for a while, they probably work well if they've persisted. And, um, you know, these metaphors inform a lot of our design decisions. And just more concretely in, in XR, I highly recommend everyone who's creating an XR to play through what is the st considered the state of the art in interaction um, uh, today. And so, you know, there's that's a little fuzzy because not everyone's going to agree, but for example, if somebody puts $100 million into a AAA VR title and has a great design sense, let's say Half-Life Alex, they put a lot of time into that design. Um, if you're a designer in XR or you're a developer wanting to upskill your design, you want to just draw from the stuff that's already out there so you have a baseline. It's not always the right decision, um, but I find for you know, new teammates, new younger people who are just coming up, the first thing and easiest thing is to just go, it sounds odd, play a bunch of VR games, play the good ones that you know are highlighted by folks who have opinions. We have some opinions, uh, depends on your industry. Uh, and then you take you take some ideas as from the good, the golden examples and improve on them, right? Do better than what's already out there. Um, and so everyone who, uh, who I work with, I usually, I usually say, okay, you got it. First things first, like spend a week playing these 10 things. And then let's mm -hmm. like, you know, figure out the locomotion system, right? Everyone's got to pick, how do you move in your world? And there are lots of choices, but you should at least know what's commonly being done in the, uh, that's been trodden before you. Yeah. It's the, Absolutely. the real world is the, one of the biggest places for inspiration. Okay. We are uh, pretty, pretty over on time, but one final question will announce our winner. Um, the, you have created wonderful uh, metaphors for those, those real world uh, examples that have existed. And it's a great way to get involved. What has been your favorite piece of user feedback that you've received so far about this um, metaphor for creation that you, that you've made? Oh, yeah, I can think if it's of also feedback broad, in, I can think of feedback that involves uh, expletives because that, that often <laughs> tells us that we're um, in the wrong direction. <laughs> no, and, and a positive, a positive, like oh, man. oh, excited, <laughs> excitement, excited, like. Um, well, I just say you know I have many bits of feedback I love. Uh, I think the best part is when I see a user testing something we've built that I can just see has sort of hit uh, a magic moment. Sometimes people pull the headset off because they're, um, you know, overwhelmed or something. You know, there's various reasons people bounce. Sometimes people take off their headsets and they just go like, whoa, I didn't know I could do that, right? And so, you know, th those are the moments that, that I think really, we know, okay, that thing that we just did is get, getting closer to that creative power that we're trying to make people feel. I know Edo's had lots of those experiences with users as well, especially younger ones, right? Because they're the ones that are going to be building this, these, these worlds, right? <laughs> um, yeah, those, the, they're incredible. Like the, I, the definitely try to anybody uh, on, on the call, like do try it out. It's really quite an incredible experience. I almost couldn't describe patch world the first time tried it out. Like you just have to do it. It's just an experience on that same note, as we mentioned, one of our, uh, viewers, one of our question askers, um, is going to receive one of the codes we have for it. And that's going to go to Mehmet is, uh, for his question about the middleware for the project, as well as, uh, the audio playback engine and the design of your interfaces and kind of breaking away from, even though we are modeling it off of the real world analogs that we're, we're shifting to something that could be something totally new. So we will reach out to you and send out that code directly. Um, but that sure. is, we're a little over, but we're definitely uh, done on time. Thank you so much, Joel and Edo, for uh, the information and presentation and making such a wonderful uh, experience. Um, I, I thoroughly, I'm, I look forward to experimenting with it more and more. Um, I've been messing around with it this week and I hope that everybody else here will also go out and try it. Um, yeah. So. Thanks a lot for having us. It's great. And then we're available in this course. It's always great to see what kind of ideas and things we end up coming up with. And see if we can help to make it bigger, nicer, smoother.
Yeah, yeah. Our, thank our you, pleasure. everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for first of all making this, uh, let's say, greater tool plus game. And uh, I know that you are now in the critical process of like the first launch period, right? So if anyone interested in supporting this creator team, feel free to play, give feedback, give reviews, ratings. So this is what actually uh, the best thing that we can help and uh, a little bit of encourage this kind of ambitious projects, especially create, creating a creator tool in a standalone headset is quite ambitious. So uh, again, thanks for your time and knowledge. Uh, sharing experience sharing i hope to see you in the following uh, events and open lectures and uh, yeah uh, thanks ian for the moderation joseph and everyone and let's hope to see everyone here in the next open lecture yeah thank you everyone and Cheers. see you in the next event thank you have a great one <laughs> bye. bye bye cheers thank you for coming Thanks for having us. It was great. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>